I'd like to thank uh, everyone uh, for joining today. Uh, we have our COVID-19 roundtable with Drs. Eden Erdman and Caslo and uh, Ms. Bianca Godwins. Uh, so I'm Paul Muttner, Associate Dean for Research here at the School of Public Health. I'd like to ask our, um, I guess our discussants to, um, to introduce, briefly introduce themselves. And then we'll start with some uh, prepared questions. And then we'll open the floor for uh, questions from everyone who's participating today. And so maybe if we can start with the introductions, um, Dr. Caslow, could you go first? Well, I uh, have a longer career than most in this group. Uh, I started my career in infectious diseases with training uh, in internal medicine and ID. I have a 23 year history of uh, service in the public health service at NIH and CDC. I came to UAB in 1995 and spent 17 years doing epidemiology of immune infectious diseases. Then went to the VA for about five years in the central office in the Office of Public Health there and retired in uh, 2016. And I'm happy to say that I can keep one or two fingers in without getting too overwhelmed. <laughs> okay, great, thank you. Um, Ms. Ms. Godwins. Hello everyone, um, my name is Bianca Ume now, I'm formerly Godwins, but I am a uh, medical student technically at this point, uh, preparing to uh, graduate soon. Uh, I've actually also was and have been one of the project managers for our contact tracing team. Um, so I'm very excited to be here and to talk more. I know we had conversations in the last round. Very excited to, uh, to be here with you guys. Well, thank you for joining. Uh, Dr. Erdman. Hello, everybody. Uh, happy to be back. Uh, my name is Nathan Erdman. I'm an MD, PhD in infectious diseases. I um, previously worked on HIV, doing viral immunology, and then have been on for COVID, been doing the immunology side of things while also working on clinical trials and therapeutics. And then um, in one of our MPIs with uh, Dr. Levitan uh, for the long COVID effort with the NIH. Okay, thank you. I think Dr. Eden is going to try to call in. She's in clinic. And so we will, why don't we come back to Dr. Eden in, um, in a minute? So I'm going to start off with some questions, and maybe we can start off with uh, um, Dr. Caslow. Um, and this first set of questions is about mask wearing. And what would you advise people about wearing masks when they go inside a building, you know, for example, a grocery store? Um, I think everybody agrees now, is starting to be a consensus, that there is no consensus. Uh, that is, everything is going to have to be more individualized and just going to depend on your age, your underlying health, and the geography, where you are and probably the immediate environment and how long you tend to be exposed. If you're gonna run in and buy a couple of items and get out within the next five minutes or so, it's probably not all that important, but if you're gonna be spending more and more time in any kind of a building where you're not sure of the ventilation, where the, you may be waiting in line for a period of 10, five or 10 minutes or so on, then uh, Obviously, people who are more vulnerable are going to have to think more carefully about wearing masks. So I think it's going to be quite individual, difficult to make a general guideline. Okay. A uh, couple quick follow up questions that you kind of maybe have addressed, and uh, I'll toss this over to Bianca or anyone else who wants to answer this. Should people wear masks when in crowded spaces? Let's say a concert or um, another gathering like that. And uh, follow up since, you know, I think it may come up is transportation, uh, airports and airplanes. Any, yeah. any thoughts about those uh, settings? 
I'm of the personal philosophy that although Dr. Caldwell made the great point that there is no consensus, you know, and that reality right now in the pandemic is every individual um, being responsible for their own health and taking their uh, precautions depending on the community levels of COVID in their respective area. Um, but I am a philosophy of faith and sorry. Um, and I think that although our numbers you know, have decreased to a point that, you know, make some more comfortable, uh, that there, there are still others who are very much so susceptible to COVID-19. I think I may have mentioned this during our last uh, chat as well too during this hour in terms of uh, just kind of imploring people to keep in mind not only their selves but those that are around them so again i'm, I'm of the philosophy of a crowded space i think it's still healthy uh, to mask and you may not follow that if you're outside of that space there's actually a great cdc resource i'm going to drop in the chat that now shows community levels of covid and lets you know whether it's you know you're at low risk for getting infected uh, medium risk or high risk um, to better inform to um, you know depending on their count on with COVID how at risk am I um, how much at risk am I in this particular area on um, uh, what the the particular CDC tool you know lets you know then you can now make a more informed decision as to whether uh, you want to utilize or not. Um, Okay, thank you. And what is the thought um, about, and this is for any of the panelists, about whether the government should end the mask uh, requirement for transportation, that is, you know, especially airports and airplanes? I, mean, I think it's going through the 18th or something. From a policy side, it's challenging just because you have, you have this polarization to accommodate. It's funny to me that everyone's willing to go buy their little vitamin C boosters before they get on a plane, but now they don't want a mask when they're gonna be sitting next to someone for three hours. Um, I think it'd be a pretty straightforward argument to be made that the it's a relatively high risk encounter in the absence of a pandemic. So there's some utility to having it in place just because, but policy wise, there's a lot of pressure to start pulling things back. And that's happening from all sides of the, of the aisles now, just because Everyone wants to be able to show progress and not be told what to do anymore. Um, it's an entirely justifiable personal choice, though, to keep it on, although really masks work best when it's you and the people around you, not just the person trying to protect themselves. And I think that's often gets swept under the rug. Masks are OK for you, but they work pretty darn well when the whole group has them on. Um, but it's going to be awfully challenging to enforce that at scale going forward. Yeah, I agree. I, I don't think a firm mandate is going to be enforceable, even if it were be if it were still desirable right now. But I would think they should still recommend it uh, and let people make their own choices. Uh, we're supposed to be traveling at the end of this week, and I intend to wear a mask in the airport. Uh, and it's going to be an N95 mask, too, because I'm at least as much interested in protecting myself as I am everybody else around me since I'm a little older than most of you and uh, feel like I probably have some degree of immunosuppression even if it isn't formally recognized. And so um, building on that, there's a question in the chat box about can we define vulnerable, you know, vulnerable to what uh, death, long COVID hospitalization? It's an yeah, interesting point. I mean, I think every, these decisions now are being driven both intrinsically and extrinsically. Before, it really was a pretty straightforward argument. Either you were going to be willing to kind of participate and function in the social square by trying to protect your neighbor. And now we're kind of transitioning out of that where it's a more intrinsic and extrinsic. So extrinsic is how much of the disease is out there currently and what is kind of the vaccination status within your community. Um, we are right now ticking up in cases, which is entirely predictable, and that's what we would expect. And there's some benefit to wearing masks a bit more vigilantly now as the community rates go up, um, but that's going to go back down, presumably relatively soon. And then intrinsic is not only what is your situation, what is your likelihood of, of transmitting or replicating virus, but also who are your immediate contacts and what situation are you in, because really the role of masks is best suited towards trying to limit um, spreading at scale, so these super spreader events when you're having multiple people in presence of each other. 
So I think it's each individual now has to kind of make that decision on when it makes sense because the um, public enforcement of these is really going to be very difficult to employ at scale, just given the current environment. Dr. Eaton. So, uh, Dr. Hidalgo, to your question, I think it's a great question. I think it also depends on who is who's doing the defining, right? I think as a society here in Alabama, um, it's been very clear that um, vulnerable to infection has not been of relevance to most of our community for some time, getting infected, um, be it in the schools or the workplace. I just don't think there has been a concern, um, a fear, if you will, of that for, for months, maybe a year. Um, I think at the health system level also, where you're seeing large organizations making policies, I think we're still really focused on healthcare utilization, not just hospitalization, but clinic utilization. Um, and so I think a lot of us, although we have felt good in the last month or so, we're, you know, we're following the data closely on, on uh, BA2 specifically and, you know, watching, waiting, hoping we don't have a variant of concern, but I think most of the chatter around here in clinics and hospitals has been around clinic utilization more broadly than just hospitalization, also ER visits. So I think really, um, you know, when you talk to somebody in the community versus those of us who are in the front lines, I think our concerns and our definitions vary. And I will also say I was in Washington, D.C. and in Charlottesville for spring break with my kids. And most of the, the Smithsonian's are now mask optional, but it's surprising how many people are still masking in public places in Washington, D.C. and Charlottesville. Um, and I, so I think it, it'll be very interesting to see once the um, mask requirements for public transportation, such as planes, is dropped. I think you may be pleasantly surprised how many continue to mask. And I'm not just talking about elderly people. I'm talking about entire families at an art gallery, including, you know, toddlers. So it's also a reminder that what we're seeing in and around Alabama is very much not representative of the rest of the U.S. Okay, great. Thank you. Dr. Eden, I'm going to stay with you for this next question. And it's brought up in the chat, but I know I was thinking about this beforehand as well, or we, we were thinking about it beforehand. And this is, um, should people be getting a fourth shot? Um, and then, of course, there are a lot of subparts to that everyone, you know, maybe someone in their 50s who's otherwise healthy and 80 year old, et cetera. And also, you know, is now the time to get it? Is it worth waiting to the fall where cases are maybe going to go up again? Do you have thoughts about this? Yeah, I do. And I'll be honest, I have a, I have a really hard time making um, a one size fits all recommendation. Anyone who's called or texted me I will share the recent um, recommendation for 50 and over to get that for us. But I also ask, when was your booster? Have you had COVID natural infection? If so, when? Was it Delta? Was it Omicron? And I think most of us, I'm curious Nathan's thoughts on this as well, um, immunocompetent host, um, vaccinated, boosted, Certainly, if they had Omicron, I have encouraged them, even though the guidance may say they're due for that fourth, I've encouraged them to wait a little bit if they have no comorbidities. Um, sorry, this computer's playing some games on me. But I've encouraged them to wait a little bit, watch and you know, watch for new variants of concerns. But what we know is that those that have that hybrid immunity from natural infection plus vaccine acquired immunity, those folks are doing quite well. Um, I am in that category, um, but um, we do think they will be protected for some time. Certainly as, as we're watching and waiting for the next variant of concern, that may change, um, but um, that subset I've, I've told they could differ. Now, if they are meet the criteria for a fourth um, vaccine um, based on age, based on comorbidities, um, have not had Omicron, maybe even had Delta, I tell them go ahead. Because what I know from my patient population is that people that got Delta, even vaccinated folks that got Delta, I've seen some Omicron cases in that population. So I'm more likely to recommend they get another vaccine. Um, okay, great. Um, Dr. Caslow or Dr. Erdman or Bianca, anything to add to that? Well, again, I, I think I think Ellen described the the uh, variations on the theme very well. Uh, it depends on 
several circumstances, uh, your condition and what you've had in the past and so forth. Uh, I think generally, the older you are, the more immunosuppressed you might be, uh, recognized or not, uh, probably the sooner you should get it. But whether it's better to wait for five months versus eight months and so on is really going to be a pretty arbitrary decision and maybe based on some of the things that Dr. Eaton was talking about. I think the boost, especially when the products are still from the original strain, the boost is a pretty transient boost. Um, that may change here in the next few months because there's products that are getting closer where we may expand the immunogenicity that's provided with the vaccine. But right now, the boost really should be targeted for those that are more vulnerable um, to really more severe presentations to answer to, you know, for Dr. Hidalgo, but also for when the um, community rates appear to be kind of heading that direction. So um, I recommend to my immuno vulnerable patients to go ahead and proceed with boost right now, just knowing that we are kind of having this increasing spike in um, Omicron and the Omicron variants. Um, but I expect things to get relatively quiet for a few months after that. I wouldn't really be pushing a whole lot of populations to urgently go out and get their booster after we get through this next uh, bump. But I do expect to, there should be a pretty vigorous push as we get into the fall with an anticipated next spike that could um, very well encompass something that's a little bit uh, different immunologically. To, to piggyback off of uh, Dr. Erdman briefly, because he made a good point as well, too, in terms of um, even if those that are more immunocompromised or older are being proactive by getting their booster shots, um, just also the reality of, you know, if there is another future surge, uh, it being wise, of course, to get it prior to that point, but in, you know, just doing some readings and research as to COVID right now, you know, the vaccines right now. And of course, with the boosters, there's not yet a plethora of um, evidence-based research beyond the fact that it's, it's safe, you know, for, our, for the general population to take. But one particular point that I saw, you know, that was what I consider to be a very good point in terms of also considering the timing of when that booster shot in. So again, you know, Piggyback, piggybacking off of Dr. Erdman again, you know, if we are, you know, watching what where the numbers are headed, you know, what the trend line is looking like in terms of the potential for um, another surge, it may be wise, you know, to also, uh, in considering that timing, work on getting that vaccine at least uh, a couple weeks before. You know, I know that, of course, predicting a surge is, is like the stock market or trying to, you know, uh, predict when that will happen. But of course, we can get a general idea from what the trends are looking like. Like and um, uh, it takes about two weeks or so for the vaccine to um, really take its full effect in terms of boosting your immunity and your body providing the appropriate response. Uh, so getting it at least a couple of weeks before that surge point may be a, a healthy and wise thing for the greater population to do, even if those that are older and um, that are more uh, uh, at risk for COVID-19 are proactive by getting their, their second boosters right now. Hey, Nathan, I just wonder if it's worth very briefly touching on the concept of antigenic sin or whether it's a sin to even think about that. Well, thank you for handing me that one. <laughs> it's, a, <laughs> it's a complicated topic. I know. Um, you know <laughs> we see this manifest in our organ transplant recipients because they can't really broaden their repertoire, which is interesting. Um, I mean, there's a lot of different layers to that onion, but the, really the concept is that as you kind of, as the immune system is trained to recognize certain parts, it, it's more and more focused on that. The boost is kind of a way to kind of draw out some of that and get better antibody to that. And you can actually get some um, representation a bit more broadly. But the, the concern is that if you keep kind of hammering that and the, the natural virus is drifting away from that, yeah. that you get you get more locked in on a response or less able to, to drift. Um, you know, I guess the way I would think about this in specific, specific for SARS-CoV-2 is that I don't really care who gets infected for the vast majority of people. I care about their ability to pr protect their lower airway. And the vaccines have shown over and over and over again that the protection that's provided uh, through vaccination against the lower airway and more severe presentations is quite good. So even if you have angex and you're a little bit slow to pick up at the mucosa, the newer strain of virus, you're still well positioned to fight off the more severe presentations that involve uh, respiratory involvement. So I think overall that's good. Where it gets a little bit more challenging is trying to think through what that means for our, our immune suppressed populations because it really is difficult for them to kind of make a protective immune response that uh, limits the lower airway presentations. 
and that's going to remain a struggle. Yeah. Although finally we have some therapeutics now with antivirals and with antibodies that can supplement that immune response a bit. Although using that at scale remains somewhat challenging. Good, not bad summary for 30 years worth of uncertainty and research in this area. Yeah, I look forward to whatever you pitch to me next. <laughs> so a question from Dean Irwin in the chat. Uh, can we take anything positive from the European response to BA2? Uh, total cases rose as the proportion of BA2 increased, but followed by a rapid decline, at least in the UK. So we are, uh, we are just now seeing an increase in total cases in the US. What does your crystal ball look like or tell us? So I'll give my take on it. And then I bet Dr. Eaton has a different one. I've been accused over and over for the past couple of years of being far too cynical because in February of 2020, I said out loud that everyone is going to get this and that's just kind of the way it's going which is another topic of talking about the endemicity of the virus um, but i think between the high burden of exposure to multiple strains of the virus and the role of vaccination is that we're going to continue to have waves of community transmission but the number of severe cases should be pretty limited and i am and perhaps a bit too overconfident although i'm trying to prepare for the worst and be a, a recognize the possibility for more cases of uh, severe presentations of Omicron. I'm pretty darn optimistic that we're gonna see a transient nudge in community cases and that that shouldn't really manifest in the hospitals. It gets a little bit more exciting when you start playing that out to future variants and what this could look like in the fall when you have kind of a collective waning of immunity. Um, but even then, I still am, remain rather optimistic that the memory responses that are in the lower airway are much more robust than those that are on the mucosa. And that even if we have an increase in transmission that we should still be much more protected from the more severe presentations. Dr. Eden, any thoughts? Do you, yeah, do you I, disagree? I actually, yeah, no, I actually agree um, with Dr. Erdman. Um, what we saw even with Omicron uh, was widespread transmission, but a lot of the cases were in those families who had been doing everything um, at least in my community, the kids that got Omicron from schools, including my family, were the kids who were wearing their, you know, KN95, um, the only one in class. They were fully vaccinated. A lot of kids who were doing everything by the books, which tells me that the other children already had some immunity, whether they knew it or not, whether they had been tested or not. And even this week, I have two friends, uh, two family friends whose children have been diagnosed, um, both families who have to date, unaware of an infection. Um, and I think what this tells you, at least for Alabama and our community, which has been pretty much wide open and back to normal for the better part of 18 months, is that there's a fair degree of, of combined natural plus vaccine acquired immunity here. I think that BA2, um, everything I'm hearing about it is that there is protection from those of us who had Omicron and and certainly that hybrid immunity I mentioned earlier. So I think what you're going to see in Alabama is small cluster sporadic cases. I don't feel comfortable saying that it's endemic at this point, but I think we're headed that way. And I think for communities like ours that have seen a lot of disease so far are actually going to do quite well. Um, I think we'll continue to see a low level of hospitalizations, which any level of hospitalization to me at this point is unacceptable, especially for normal hosts who are unvaccinated. Um, so I do, I think there's opportunity for improvement. I think we shouldn't be seeing hospitalizations of young, healthy, unvaccinated individuals. Um, and then certainly we, we all are working to improve outcomes in the immunocompromised cohort, those that are like Nathan's patients, for example, but even they are seeing a lot better outcomes now and have a lot more treatment options and prevention options, right, than we saw for, with Delta, for example. So I'm, I'm hopeful. Um, again, I also give the caveat that I've been really optimistic with every wave, um, uh, which is interesting because I think a lot of the folks that are kind of COVID deniers have said that we are fear mongering. But when I look back objectively, I've actually underestimated every one of our surges. So I'll give that caveat as well. I've been wrong before. <laughs> Yeah, I have an anecdote of, of one. Uh, my nine-year-old grandson uh, got his first vaccine, developed a mild case of COVID. Uh, this was during Delta, I believe. Then got his second vaccine, was fine. And uh, two days ago, developed another case, which was based, the, his testing was based on a mild hoarseness, and that's it no other symptoms whatsoever. So uh, he's now had 
two vaccines and two episodes of COVID and none of them have created either, neither of them created any problem for them. So I, I'm inclined to agree with, with what you guys have said. So building on that. Uh, just one other point. I, I, you know, the, the question was about comparison between Europe and, and here, particularly the UK. And of course, the circumstances, the relative proportions of people with uh, natural infection and immunity versus those who've been vaccinated are different uh, across Europe and with, between different European countries. So it's pretty hard to predict based on what happened there. Okay, great, thank you. So this has kind of been alluded to. Does, uh, does anyone anticipate, do any of you anticipate a, another major wave of cases? And I've heard maybe in the fall and um, are there any thoughts about, you know, about that and whether it's something that we should be concerned about? I for one have zero reservations that there's gonna be future waves and waves plural in the future with high frequency of community transmission. I'm also optimistic that that's not really gonna matter, at least as far as kind of the apocalyptic scale that everyone's gotten used to. When I say surge, that means transmission with a highly transmissible isolate that in the setting of waning immunity, but that is not synonymous with massive numbers of severe respiratory presentations and high morbidity and mortality. Um, the one wild card is just knowing the potential of SARS-CoV-2 and other coronaviruses to go in and out of other vectors and repackage itself. So the wild card remains, could SARS-CoV-2 really kind of get a whole new outfit on by going in and out of a deer or a, a woodchuck or whatever it happens to be and come back as a whole new entity that our immune protection really doesn't protect against. But we'll see surges uh, indefinitely with this endemic virus but hopefully that's just a upper respiratory infections that have little impact at a population at scale. Um, and this fall will be a good time for that to happen again, but there's nothing particularly special about that. Uh, so the question in the chat box, based on earlier data from Hong Kong, there was some indication that BA2 was severe for children, not just the unvaccinated older group. Any thoughts about this? I think it's just gonna be hard to replicate that here in the US. To be just from what I mentioned, the degree of, of you know immunity, in, which is a broad term, but whether it's from natural infections over you know in 2020 and 2021 and 2022, plus some vaccination, I just don't anticipate. You know, Hong Kong was a different population; they had strict mitigation measures. I don't know that those children, and I haven't reviewed this data, but I just don't anticipate they have that protection. Um, when it comes to future variants. And, and Nathan, you may be more familiar with this data. I just, I, we haven't seen it so far. I'm hopeful we won't. And I, I just don't see a scenario where we see a lot of severe BA2 in kids in the US. Yeah, between that being a small data set and also even regionally, but largely nationally, there were a lot of cases of Omicron in kiddos. And the likelihood of there being huge burdens of kiddo disease with um, BA2, I think is extremely unlikely. Um, again, the one thing I've learned with SARS-CoV-2 is to not say state anything in absolutes. So I'd be keeping an eye on it, but I certainly don't have a huge predisposition to think to expect that. Yeah, I, I would wonder what the true denominator of infection was in that group. Did they really have an accurate assessment of what proportion were getting seriously ill? Okay, great. So the next uh, set of questions has to do with long COVID and uh, Dr. Hidalgo had a comment in uh, the chat box about this. Um, so what do we know about long COVID? Um, and, you know, we can start off with just something generic, but also Dr. Hidalgo mentions um, if it only occurs in people with initial infection or is it uh, occurring in individuals with prior exposure and or vaccination. And so I'm not sure who would like to take a first stab at this one. You know, um, one thing that's still hard, you know, for us to, at least data-wise, is that there's still, it's still kind of hard to predict those that will definitively experience long COVID. 
Um, of course, you know, those with comorbidities, they have higher risk, but, you know, it's still kind of hard to gauge that, you know, but I can say from, from personal experience in, in uh, seeing patients over the course of the day, um, a wide array of patients that, you know, I've, I've come across a number who have been more on the, uh, uh, more on the elderly range. So, probably about 50 to 60 or up who, you know, had COVID, maybe just a good you know, six months, between six months to a year, but are experiencing those effects of, you know, long COVID, whether they had prior exposure or a vaccination, you know, or not. So the head fogginess, uh, you know, insomnia, breathing issues. Um, so again, it's still hard to predict those that will definitively have that long COVID, um, but there are definitely do those that are experiencing it. And from my experience um, thus far, with all my rotations, I've seen that it's been a lot of, of the more el elderly patients that are dealing with the long COVID. Any other comments about long COVID? And uh, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think it's clear at all whether it relates more or less to initial versus subsequent infection or whether if you're vaccinated, you're more protected. I don't, I don't think the data are in at this point. No, the, so I will spare you all kind of an hour soliloquy on long COVID because um, there still remain a lot of unknowns there. Um, but some comments to that. Turns out it's really, really hard to define a denominator for long COVID because there's so much variability in those initial presentations. And it's only getting harder now that you kind of smatter on various vaccine regimens and um, repeat exposure. So I don't think we're, we're never going to have a really robust number as far as the affliction rate with alpha strain. And even going forward until we have kind of a true baseline um, and like endemic state of the disease, it's going to be really hard to know how frequent long COVID is. Um, the burden of that long COVID, I, I, don't, I haven't seen anything that suggests that you can predict who is likely to get it outside of those that have more severe presentations are more likely to have manifestations of long COVID, but that largely is a function of critical illness, not just specifically SARS-CoV-2 interactions. Um, there is something unique about SARS-CoV-2 in that there uh, do appear to be pretty robust long COVID or post-viral syndromes in those that even have mild disease, where it gets really messy is trying to differentiate what is function of kind of end organ damage in the acute phase, what is something that slowly builds up later that is unique to the virus, and then how is this virus different than what we do know are post-viral syndromes and influenza and RSV, these things happen, but we've just never seen it kind of at a global phase all simultaneously. Um, Recover is going to get at some of this stuff. We're going to be much better at uh, kind of defining what those syndromes are and aren't, and hopefully we get at some of the mechanisms. And I am say that specifically some of the mechanisms because there's going to be multiple different disease processes afoot. Um, but I don't think we're going to have a really great handle on the um, denominator. I there has been some suggestion that vaccine and prior infections seem to tamper down the frequency of long COVID, but the data isn't robust or definitive yet. Although I'd be surprised if that's not the case. Yeah, I was just going to add that um, certainly anecdotal evidence should never replace robust studies, but in the absence of some of that data, as um, you all have alluded to, um, I'll just share my clinic population. We've seen a lot of COVID to run through our patients, HIV infected, lots of comorbidities. Um, I will say very few people having any long-term sequela of those who had Omicron, and then of those who, with or without vaccines, to be honest, um, vaccinated or not, those who've gotten Omicron have seen mild infection, minimal to any long-term sequela. Of those who had the Delta, um, some of them that were uh, certainly and vaccinated, I've seen more long-term complications. And we know the variants prior to Delta, we saw that. Um, but of my fully vaccinated patients living with HIV, again, high-risk you know, high group, lots of comorbidities, um, of the vaccinated ones who got Delta, even though some of them had pretty significant symptoms, I haven't seen any long-term complications in that vaccinated group. So I, based on my experience here in the clinic, I, I think it's gonna be, um, unlikely that those of us who had prior infection and or vaccination, ideally both, um, will have any long COVID symptoms moving forward. And there's a question in the chat box about um, cognition, cognitive decline and dementia um, after infection. I'm not sure if this is something that you've seen much of or at all. <laughs> 
this definitely actually, aware of that observation. Um, that is in neurologic circles, that's a major issue. It actually harkens back to something that we saw with Zika too. There was a concern that the viral tropism may help trigger um, CNS inflammation that could lead to neurocognitive impairment. We know that there's a variety of overlapping CNS syndromes that relate to post-COVID symptoms. Um, the burden of that and really how it plays out at population level is to be determined. I think one of the reasons that you haven't heard more about at large because A, there's been so much other stuff going on and B, our ability to intervene in a meaningful way is so limited outside of kind of the um, interventions that we can do on the preventing acute disease or limiting the progression of the acute disease. Um, but I'd be shocked if it doesn't become a larger topic for conversations. We kind of get through the early phase of understanding SARS-CoV-2 and get a better handle on what it's going to mean longer term, particularly is if, it, if the risk persists beyond kind of the initial couple exposures to the virus. Okay, so uh, one last question, which I may have come up a little bit earlier, and then obviously please others uh, use the chat function uh, to ask questions. Should we now say that COVID is endemic versus an epidemic? <laughs> that depends on the definitions of those two terms. Um, I, I think we're talking about a transition to endemic, but different infectious diseases have had different forms of endemicity. Uh, you can have an infection that's at a baseline all the time and have spikes that we call sporadic uh, or periodic epidemics. It's sort of like flu, flu is more regular, but other infections have more irregular periodicity or, or what I call sporadicity. It, you could call it a sporademic as opposed to a, uh, an endemic. Uh, and, and it's gonna change as Nathan has said, we haven't settled into a sort of baseline state yet. So what we call a wave or what we call an epidemic is gonna depend on what the rates are at, at any given moment, which are gonna change and they're gonna be different from different places and so on. So. Uh, I don't know that picking a term right now makes a lot of sense. Okay, so um, a question from the Dean, is one of those areas of overlap with symptoms that suggest MS in the 40s, uh, 40 and 50 year olds? I'm not sure if there are any comments think, about that. Yeah, I think that was related to Nathan's discussion around inflammation and, and Zika in that example. Is, is that right, Dean? I think the, the only honest answer I can say is yes, probably. <laughs> the degree to which is to be determined. Like there have been reports of some autoimmune antibodies that seem to correlate with long COVID symptoms. There's clearly evidence of some compartmentalized inflammation, but it's not exactly clear what the mechanisms are. There is suggestion that the virus itself can be tropic and make its way into the CNS, but there's also evidence to suggest that that's not what's happening all the time, and it may be kind of more compartmentalized inflammation. Um, some of this is probably being driven systematically, systemically and then showing up in the CNS, and then it is compounded by the overlapping sy syndromes of what can happen peripherally that's separate from what's happening in the CNS itself. Um, I will just leave it as that it's a mess and I'm not smart enough to know exactly what's going on yet, but I'm hopeful that the collective effort will start shining some light on some of these overlapping kind of presentations that are all related to the virus itself. Thank you. Another question from Dr. Hidalgo, which I've seen a fair bit about, I think it's a really interesting question. Hopefully I'm going to paraphrase this correctly is, you know, Given that all, uh, given all of the unknowns that have been mentioned on this call, whether about future variants, long COVID, et cetera, length of vaccine protection, um, what is the thought about the balance of public health interventions versus individual, or sorry, individualistic approaches at this stage, where public, you know, public health is, you know really geared towards protecting the community um, with, you know, broad, you know, vaccination efforts and mask mandates versus the individual, individual, 
individual individualistic approach, sorry, of you know, people make their own decisions. I think that, you know, honestly, it's been even with the mandates and you know, public health efforts, it's still been largely an individual, you know, approach to how COVID is handled. I mean, only about maybe 30% or so of like the US population has their booster shots right now. So I, I mean, it just speaks to that reality of like, again, it, it having been in, honestly individualistic from the very beginning. So, I mean, I just, I foresee that that's only going to, you know, to to continue, you know, I'm more along the lines of, you know, the optimism that, that Dr. Eaton mentioned, the perspective that she took um, in regards to COVID. I'm, I'm similar in that and trying to be optimistic for the future. But, um, you know, again, it's been an individualistic approach to whether you'll get uh, vaccinated, uh, you know, whether you'll follow the, the precautionary measures or not, um, and that that will only in continue um, as we continue onwards. I mean, I think that it is comforting, you know, to at least know that, okay, at this particular stage of the pandemic, considering the immunity that's present and, um, you know, that they're the, the larger part of our population that has experienced in mass the very serious effects, you know, that that has, has likely passed. Uh, but even still, you know, I, I can't continue to, you know, impress enough the importance of keeping in mind, not just you, but those that are, you know, around you. And I'm more so concerned about how that individualistic approach may, you know, affect the those that are immunocompromised. Now I had a um, actually a couple of patients who one in particular that um, got COVID and only, it only exacerbated their MS. And then one interesting case that I actually just saw this last Thursday where they actually had received the COVID vaccine um, and it elicited a response that was similar to what Dr. Caswell mentioned, um, his grandson experience, excuse me if I'm wrong. Uh, but yes, that it, it was it was interesting to note that in terms of how they, you know, they received the vaccine um, as an MS patient and it exacerbated their symptoms like even more. So um, regardless, you know, again, I just think that it's important to, to keep in mind that even though the CDC has, you know, recommended that, you know, every, everyone at this point take that ind individualistic approach as to what, what they want to follow or not based on the community levels, um, that it's still important to keep in mind those that are more susceptible, you know, around us. Part of, it's a very good question because it's such a challenge to kind of navigate because everything's transitioning. I would argue that particularly from the public health perspective and particularly after the last couple of years that leaning into the nuance and acknowledging the nuance is really important. I think a part of the reason, I mean, there's a lot of reasons we will probably skip going into about what has kind of driven the discourse around COVID and everything else, but um, kind of the absolutist phase of things isn't nearly as practical now to discuss. And there's so much variation on a given region by region, locale by locale, but also individual to individual. I think acknowledging that's pretty darn important. Um, it's been hard in media and particularly in policy to kind of recognize that nuance and be thoughtful to various different approaches to it. Um, and frankly, that should have been the case when we were in early mitigation because that was all we had and it really needed to be far, far more absolute to be beneficial. And there was some success there and some spectacular failures as well. But kind of going forward in the new reality, I think there needs to be an emphasis on what that nuance is and how best to kind of deal with what the day-to-day, minute-to-minute looks like. And then also emphasize what can be controlled, which are the therapeutic tools, vaccination and such. Yeah, I have a feeling that we're going to be, for at least for the near term, we're going to be converging on a, a, a sort of influenza-like approach to it, where we know the firm things that we can recommend, and they'll be recommended, and nobody's going to mandate anything, uh, except maybe in hospital settings or whatever, where it's been a lot of controversy, even for flu. Uh, but I think we're going to have to back off and deal only with the, the things that are as clear cut as they can be until we see what happens over the next year or two or more. I um, totally agree. And I was going to take um, Nathan's lean into what we know comment um, and, and what you all have alluded to with some specifics that I would like to see now. Um, Fortunately, the last month or so, there's been a little bit of a time to take a deep breath, um, return to some of our other non-COVID duties, and I would like to see the CDC now say, okay, 
we've caught our breath. How can we be positioning ourselves for the school year 2022? How can we be revising guidance for um, athletics? How can we be revising guidance for um, outpatient clinical settings, maybe, um, or even um, other you know, gatherings of large groups that leans into what we know, and not just mask and vaccine, although I do think those are the cornerstone, but also ventilation and some other things that haven't been as mainstream in our discussions, um, because there is really just a tremendous amount of literature out there that the, the general person who's running a small business or hosting a graduation ceremony is not going to go to the CDC and pull through multiple different websites, but would they look at a nice graphic that is an updated new normal? And I think we should really lean into, hey, we know this, this much. This is our new normal. Let's normalize that just like the flu season, um, where we many of us get guidance from our schools every flu season, this needs to be the new normal where we anticipate more cases. We anticipate that there's going to be changes in the guidance as well. But for now, this is what we know and um, really focus on messaging that is low, you know, for groups with low health liter literacy, lots of images, lots of graphics, um, lots of groups that are great vectors like kids, um, like, you know, weddings and other venues where we anticipate the next of concern may be an issue. So that's what I would like to see now. Um, and again, like not polarized, not politicized, but a very much a normalized approach. This is how it is. Um, and, um, and then continued vaccination, uh, you know, continued um, research and dissemination of, of interventions that reduce vaccine hesitancy. I think that's an area where we're going to continue to see problems. I know that from talking to pediatricians, what we're seeing in the community in Alabama, at least, is that the vaccine hesitancy argument has gone beyond COVID vaccines, and now they're seeing families who traditionally get flu vaccines and other vaccines are now questioning vaccination as a whole. So I think that that area, we need to see a lot more research and a lot more work on how to create vaccine enthusiastic communities. Okay, wow, that's great. Um, so we only have a few minutes left. If anyone has any final comments, if not, We'll just give people a minute to type in any questions. Um, just to piggyback on, on what we were just discussing, the, the other thing we have uh, in some ways more than what we have for flu uh, are uh, therapeutics. And I don't know that that's been emphasized enough. I know there have been issues about distribution and availability, but, but these opportunities and options are, are pretty important to emphasize as well, uh, especially in for those who are at the early stages of infection and also for immunosuppressed and elderly in terms of uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis and so forth. So there's an interesting question in the chat box that you know I think has important implications maybe you know I'd like to think forward versus backwards and say and ask about the COVID-19 mandates and you know the, that benefit you know were the were they more beneficial than potentially negative effects they had on the economy? And I assume, you know, that's for, you know, I'm not sure if anyone wants to answer that question, but thinking more about, do you think it's going to affect future decisions in terms of pandemics? Well, it depends on how you define the question. And then it ends up getting really hard to argue against a negative. Um, because part of the, we've kind of seen this argument play out over and over politically, but it's like, well, everyone's, you know, had to stay home and no one could do all these things. Then we all got it anyways. And well, everyone said I had to go get vaccinated and then people got vaccinated and then they got it anyways. I'm trying to argue that, you know, that kind of straw man argument against what the alternative reality was, which was if we didn't have mitigation up front because there were no other tools, like if you came to me and April, May of 2020, and you were dying of COVID, we gave you oxygen and watched you die of COVID full stop. Whereas if you came in the fall of 2020, I could actually give you two medications that dramatically reduced mortality, but there was still only so much we could do. And each step we've gotten further and further along. So that was the purpose of mitigation was not to make this go away. Um, clearly there was economic cost. And I think one of the takeaways on, on the US performance is that we managed to maximize our economic costs and yet still not be effective enough to really provide as much benefit as we would have liked to do. That's 
kind of a special gap that we managed to shoot there through um, a whole bunch of um, various degrees of incompetence, frankly. But there are huge, tremendous benefits of stalling for time if we can do that more efficiently and proactively up front. Um, and hopefully the takeaway is and that even trying to bother with it is a waste of energy, which again, remember, that was a strong argument was just let everyone go wild and just not worry about it. Um, and with the transmission rates of alpha and delta, what that would have meant in practice is astounding considering where we were. I have a feeling there will be legions of economists who will be looking at that very question for years, if not decades to come. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, one thing that's been interesting to me is since this notion of like, let's get back to normal, and we saw a big push in the, with Omicron to get back to normal, but if you get the Over the Mountain Journal, like I do a free publication, I've been constantly reminded throughout the pandemic that there are balls and galas and large gatherings. Um, there have been uh, regional athletic events where all of our kids are indoors. So I think maybe if if oh he, it sounds like the question was answered. I didn't know if, if that the person who posed the question wanted to clarify. Um, I'll give my personal pet peeve, which many of you know me know I've been really frustrated with the schools because my children missed a lot of schools as 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 did their teachers. Um, there were no mask mandates in our schools throughout the most recent Omicron. So at one point, one in three Alabama students were learning virtually. And if you know much about Alabama students, you know they are the students who do not need to be learning virtually. Um, we're already very much behind. And as many of us knew, universal masking in schools significantly reduced transmission. But a lot of that data um, was from prior, um, from Delta, for example. But now after Omicron, we know that in schools where everybody was wearing a mask, the number of infections was reduced by 73%, which you can imagine is 73%, you know, that significant number in, in a school system like ours where hundreds, literally hundreds of, of students and teachers were home in January. Um, that would have been a significant number of kids in the classroom getting their free lunch, learning how to read. And I think to your point, um, Dr. Kavlo, we're, we're not gonna see, we'll be collecting the data on those indirect effects of lack of public health mitigation measures for years to come. And unfortunately, we're in a state where we know um, we have so much to overcome. So this just widens disparities for our kids um, in Alabama. So an, an unfortunate missed opportunity to implement public health measures for our kids. Okay, great. Well, we're at the, uh, we were nearing the top of the hour. I want to give people a couple minutes before a one o'clock meeting. So a very quick question, you know, Will we, and we may have a COVID round table in the fall, but do you think we'll need to? Do you think there'll be issues to discuss then? And just a quick yes or no from each of the panelists. Yes, there's gonna be new antibodies, new antivirals, new vaccine regimens, but I do not think it's gonna be anywhere near the kind of existential threat that it was for two years. I think it's gonna be more just kind of managing a nuisance as opposed to a driving societal factor. There's going to be a lot more data, whether it's worth discussing or not is another matter, but we're already on the way to having the largest number of publications ever in any infectious disease already published. So I suspect we're going to have plenty more data to look at whether we want to discuss it in the fall or not. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah. and I agree. And I was, I was just going to jump in and say, regardless of what the data and the policy shows, I know there will also be dissenting opinions. So even to have a forum to discuss those dissenting opinions, I'm sure we won't all be on board with whatever the data or guidance shows at that time. And Bianca? No, they, they beautifully wrap it up. I concur that this would very much so be, I don't want to say needed in the fall, but I can say needed at the same time, because just like Dr. Caslow mentioned, what I'm most excited about is the even more data to kind of corroborate, you know, all that we've, you know, been trying to, to, to do in terms of the COVID mitigation efforts. So, you know, in the fall time, although it may not be needed on the basis of a similar, um, as similar of a, um, a, a, an enormous surge as, as it was, you know, in the beginning part of the pandemic, that it'll still be helpful to have these conversations, you know, in the fall. And why I also say that for, 
you know, in Alabama's case um, is, in, and I know that Dr. Eaton mentioned it in the beginning as well too, in terms of her traveling and seeing just the difference in precautionary measures. And it was the same in terms of my travel, you know, my recent travels, you know, I traveled to California this last fall and they were very, very much so adamant about wearing, maybe December time or so, wearing your mask, not allowing you into spaces without a mask, et cetera. And of course it varies across the country, but to, to bring it full circle as to why these conversations are still necessary is I just don't want our population, especially Alabama's population, still being at the very last or the you know, 50th still when it comes to vaccination rates. I don't want our population to get you know, comfortable just yet. So, so yeah, I think that it'll very much still be beneficial to still be having these conversations in the fall. Great. Well, we're uh, I'd like to thank our panelists. Congratulations to Bianca about her uh, upcoming graduation and uh, just a round of virtual round of applause for everyone and hopefully uh, we'll see you in the fall when there won't be as anything too urgent to discuss but lots of interesting things.